In this video, we'll be looking at IRR filters, their theory, and also implementation on an STM32-based microcontroller, such as the one you're seeing right here. This is the little brain board connected up to an 8XL355 accelerometer. We're reading the data and then using one of our IRR filters to then filter the data. So let's get started. A big thank you to JLC PCB who are sponsoring this video and have also produced and manufactured the little brain board you saw and which we'll be running our IRR filters on. It turns out that JLC PCB actually has these purple PCBs available now and I'll be giving that a try for some future projects. If you'd like to find the little brain board design files as well as the source code I'm using in these videos, you can go to my GitHub repository at github.com slash PMS67, navigate to the little brain STM32 F4 sensor board directory and you can find all the firmware the RTOS firmware, or the libraries, schematics, and KiCad design files, and so forth. Another big thank you also to Altium for sponsoring this video. I use Altium for my work and for more complicated projects for PCB designs, hardware designs, and so forth. Altium is actually offering a free trial of Altium Designer, and if you can go to altium.com slash yt slash fills lab, you can get a free trial for yourself to see what Altium Designer is all about. In this video, we'll be covering the theory and implementation of IIR filters. I won't be covering all of IIR theory as there's very much to it, but I'll show some recommended reading in the description and in this video as well. We will look at a rough overview of digital filters and why they are needed. Then we'll compare FIR versus IIR filters, look at IIR theory, IIR design, how we can come up with our own IIR filters, and then finally we'll look at an implementation of those filters on an STM32 based embedded system in real time. Digital filters are a huge part of digital signal processing. Primarily, they are used when we need to separate signals, do signal restoration, for example, smoothing, removing unwanted frequencies, and so on. In essence, it's a single input, single output system in most cases. So on the input side, on the left here, we have this incoming signal corrupted with, for example, high frequency noise. You can see these squeals over here. Now, if we pass this through a digital filter, which we've designed correctly, we might get something like this on the output. So the underlying trend of the signal is still there, but we've removed the majority of this high frequency noise, which is a good thing in this case. Now, since we are in the digital domain, we are working with a fixed sampling time, which I'll call capital T, which is related to the sampling frequency as one over F of S. Now, according to Nyquist, that means our maximum frequencies are limited, such that the maximum frequency must be less than the sampling rate over two. A second observation is that we now are working with arrays of discrete, evenly spaced numbers, and these are evenly spaced in time and we typically call these samples. I will denote my input arrays, or my input samples with x, and then in square brackets n, where n is the sample number. An output will typically be noted by y, again with the square brackets n denoting my sample number. As you can see here, here's a plot of sample number versus sample. We have discrete, evenly spaced numbers, both in the x dimension and the y dimension. An important point with filters in general is how we can actually characterize them. Now for a digital filter, we might look at time domain properties, for example, the impulse response. Now the impulse response is something if you pass an array, for example, one followed by all zeros into a digital filter, what is the output of that filter? And we term that the impulse response. And that's, this could be something that looks like this. But that can completely characterize a linear, discrete, and time invariant filter. Another way of looking at a filter is characterizing it by its frequency domain properties, for example, the gain and phase plots. So if I pass in a sinusoidal signal of amplitude A into a filter, my output of the filter, if it's linear, discrete time, and time invariant, will be of the same frequency, but my amplitude will be changed, for example, with B, and I might introduce a phase shift, which I typically denote by phi. Now, if I plot this response of putting in various different sinusoidal signals, and measuring the output change, I can do what's called a Bode plot. So a frequency domain plot, which is the gain versus the frequency, as well as the phase versus the frequency. So these are two ways we can characterize our filters and determine if they're suitable for our applications. Now, before continuing with this video, I'd highly recommend you watch the FIR filter design and software implementation video that you can find on my channel. And that'll teach you a bit more about FIR filters and see how they might be different to IIR filters. Here, I'll just give you a brief overview before we dive into IR filters, what the main differences are. 
Just looking at the name themselves, FIR stands for finite impulse response and IIR stands for infinite impulse response. So you can see on the right here, the top is, for example, a finite impulse response filter. So if I hit, for example, this system, this filter, then the output will decay to zero at some point in time. The impulse response is finite. However, if I, if I for example, hit this IR filter, the impulse response, it'll decay over time, but it will never quite reach a steady state value because it consists of decaying exponentials. In terms of performance and speed, FIR has a greater performance. That means it can separate frequencies better, it might have steeper roll-offs and so forth. So it is essentially more powerful. However, it is a lot more power hungry than an IAR filter. An IAR filter is much faster to implement and run, for example, on an embedded real-time system. Another point to note is for higher order IAR filters, these can become unstable, whereas an FIR filter is always stable. Now the ease of design is another thing. Typically FIR filters are quite straightforward to design, but when you need to change their properties, that becomes a bit harder and you have to redesign the filter. Whereas IR filters in a lot of the times will have certain parameters you can vary to quickly change the filter characteristics. Now let's look at some IR filter theory. I said before, IR stands for infinite impulse response. Essentially, the impulse response is composed of decaying exponentials. IR filters are sometimes also called recursive filters because they actually use feedback to bypass a longer convolution, and we'll see how they do that in a second. So if you remember back or see the FIR filter video, for FIR filters, we have to perform a pretty heavy convolution to get our filter output. IIR uses some of the output, feeds it back to compute the new sample. So in that way, it can be much quicker or simpler to implement. Here's the general form of an IIR filter. And don't worry, this looks like a lot, but it's actually quite simple. Our output is Y of N, so Y, our output at sample N, and that composed of multiplying constants by our input samples, so A0 times X of the current sample, plus A1 times X of the previous sample, and so on. And we can have an arbitrary length of coefficients here. And then we also add to our current output multiples of our previous outputs, multiplied by these coefficients, so B1, B2, all the way to B sub big B. So you can see here it's B1 times the previous output plus B2 times the output before the previous output, and so on. We can write this as a sum, of course, to make this a bit neater. So essentially, we're summing and multiplying the inputs, and we're summing and multiplying previous outputs. Now, A and B are called the filter coefficients, and we can twiddle or vary those to change the filter responses and characteristics. Now, with the sum from the previous slide, it was kind of hard to see what's actually going on. So often, it's quite useful to look at a block diagram view right here. And this is the general form of an IRR filter, and there's many different forms you'll see on the internet or in books. But here we have our input on the left. We have these blocks, these triangles are gain terms, and they're essentially just multiplications. And then we have a sum over here. These z to the minus 1 or z to the minus 2, z to the minus a terms are essentially sample delays. So z to the minus 1 means one delay, z to the minus 2 means two sample delays, and so forth. So here we're multiplying, delaying, and then adding all these terms together. Now we're feeding the sum into the next summing station, which is essentially our feedback section of our IRR filter. So we take our output, multiply it by some constant, delay it, and add it back to these samples over here, which we've been multiplied and delayed. And we can do that for an arbitrary amount of feedback and different coefficients. So this is a quite nice overview of what the IRR filter structure in general looks like and shows quite nicely these feed forward and these feedback terms. Now the question of course is how we can actually choose these filter coefficients. So for example, A0, A1, B0, B1, how many coefficients do we actually need to give us, for example, a desired time domain or frequency domain response or characteristics. So we might want a band pass filter or low pass filter, high pass filter and so on. How do we choose these coefficients? Now there are actually quite a few different methods to do that. There are online tools, or MATLAB, which I'll show you in just a second, which will compute these coefficients for you to get required filter characteristics. There are also standard filter types, for example, Butterworth, Chebyshev, Bessel, and so forth. Another way of getting your IIR coefficients is via an optimization algorithm. So you might have some sort of cost function because you want some desired frequency response, and you'll essentially twiddle with these coefficients until you get that desired frequency response. And of course, we can run an optimization algorithm to do that. The more straightforward way, something you can also do by hand a lot of times, is using analog prototypes, writing a differential equation, and then discretizing that differential equation to give you a difference equation, and that will actually turn into an IR filter. And I actually have a full video of how to discretize and implement emulations of analog filters, and it's called Real-Time Software Implementation of Analog Filters, and you can find it on my channel or on the link in the description below. We'll also go through a simple analog prototype from an RC low-pass filter in this video just to show you.
Another method is also to use the Z-transform to analyze what these coefficients actually do through the frequency response, and I'll go through that in this video as well. Now, as you can see, there's many different methods, and it's actually not quite as straightforward as FIR filter design. A quick Google search, if you type in online IRR filter designer, you can get a quite a few different links that'll actually help you design IRR filters. One of my favorite ones is this micromodel.com slash DSP. Unfortunately for the basic edition, it's limited to a, I think, fourth order filter, but you can choose low pass, high pass, you can choose different types of filter, you can see the response, and then also the coefficients of the filter. So I recommend you check that out and have a play around with it. MATLAB and their signal processing toolbox also have an IRR filter designer. I believe there's an app for that as well in MATLAB, and that's really useful if you want to design IRR filters quickly. Now, I'd like to go through the Z-transform method as well as the analog prototype method. But let's start with the Z-transform method. And just a warning, there's some maths ahead. Again, I have a video on how to use the Z-transform, which is a bit more detailed, and I'll leave a link to that in the description box below. But let's look at a very simple first order IRR filter. And I've written the equation for that here. So the output y of n is one minus alpha, where alpha is some sort of constant that goes between zero and one. So this constant times x of n, which is my current input sample, plus alpha times y of n minus one. So I'm feeding back my previous output sample, multiplying it by alpha and adding it to this term. So a very simple difference equation, and this is a first order IRR filter. Now in comparison to the general form, you can see that one minus alpha is actually my a zero constant or coefficient, and alpha is actually my B1 coefficient. So simply by varying alpha, I can change these filter parameters and properties and then see what this actually changes in the frequency domain. But let's go through the maths first. So starting up here, we have our difference equation. To get the frequency response, we need to take the Z transform. And again, please see my video on the channel on how to actually do that in detail. I'll just run through it quickly here. So I take my Z transform, rearrange it to give my transfer function, which is the ratio of output to input, and that turns out to be one minus alpha over one minus alpha times z to the minus one. Now remembering our theory, z to the minus one is actually equal to e to the minus j theta, and using Euler's identity, I can convert that to cos theta minus j sine theta. Now g in terms of theta, and I'll talk in a second what theta actually is, is then equal to one minus alpha divided by one minus alpha times cos theta plus j times alpha times sine theta. So we get a complex representation over here so we can take the magnitude to get the filter gain versus frequency. So this is really useful. So taking the magnitude, I've worked out the maths for you. We can plot this. It's not the nicest equation, but we can plot this in just a second. Now we can note that theta is actually the normalized angular frequency. So theta by definition is omega times t, which is our sampling period. And omega is two pi f, where f is our frequency of interest. And that means it's two pi f over fs, which is our sampling frequency. We can plot this equation over here, which we got via the Z transform, starting from our initial IRR filter description, and see how varying alpha changes the response of this filter. So here I've plotted that exact equation, so G of F in terms of alpha and my sampling frequency, F of S, and I've set my F of S at 10 hertz, and I can actually change that here. As you can see, because of the Nyquist limit, I'm only running from zero hertz on my X axis to five hertz, which is F S over two on my X axis. On my Y axis, I have my magnitude, and that goes all the way from one. So if I put a DC signal in, I will get the same amplitude DC signal out. And as my frequency increases, my gain of this filter drops. So this is a low pass filter. The low frequency content is relatively unaffected, whereas high frequency content is attenuated. I can also play with my alpha coefficient to actually see how that changes the frequency response. So if I turn alpha all the way up, almost to one, you can see that actually increases the effect of my low pass filtering. And if I decrease alpha, that actually decreases the effect of my low pass filtering. So essentially alpha, as it's ranging from zero to one, determines how much I'm filtering this signal. And it's quite nice to play around and plot this just to get a feel for how these IRR filters work and how the parameters can change. Now in contrast to FIRR filters, I, all I have to do is change my alpha term here to actually change my filter. I don't have to completely redesign my filter. So that's pretty cool and a benefit of IRR filters. A second method of designing IRR filters I'd like to show you is that of the analog prototyping method. So for example, if I have a simple electrical circuit, for example, this RC filter, which is a low pass filter, I have my input voltage here, my output voltage on the other side, a resistor and capacitor. Seeing this as an ideal circuit, the current through the resistor is the same as the current through the capacitor. Then I can use Kirchhoff's laws. So V in minus V out of R is the current through the resistor. That's equal to the capacitor current, which is C times the rate of change of the voltage across the capacitor, 
which is simply dv out by dt. Then rearranging, getting all the v outs on one side and the v in on the other side, I have a differential equation. However, this is in the continuous time domain, and I want to go to the digital domain or the discrete time domain, so I have to discretize. I can let dv by dt, or a first order derivative, approximately be equal to vn minus vn minus 1 divided by t, which is the sampling time. And that's an Euler approximation, and it comes from a first order Taylor series of expansion. Plugging that into the differential equation and discretizing, and then also rearranging, we form this difference equation. So we have v out, sample n, is this constant over here, so t over t plus rc, times v in, which is the input, plus another constant times the previous output, so v out of n minus 1. And as you can see, this form is very, very familiar to us already. Again, this is a first order IRR filter, which we got from our analog prototype RC filter. This coefficient over here is pretty much A0, and this coefficient over here is B1, if we look at the general form of an IRR filter. And when we implement this, this actually emulates an analog RC low pass filter. So let's have a look at this on an STM32 system right now. So here we are in the STM32 Cube IDE development environment. And from the previous video where we wrote a driver for an ADXL355 accelerometer, I'll be using the code. So essentially from that video, all I got was the raw accelerometer readings, X, Y, and Z axes. And I would like to perform some low pass filtering using our IRR filter. So I've made a really simple header file for this filter. I have a struct, which includes my alpha, which is my coefficient for my filter going from zero to one. And I have a float, which is an output of the filter. So I need to store my output because I'm using this for my feedback to compute the new output sample. Then I have an initialization routine, which essentially just checks if the alpha value is within range of zero to one, and then resets my output to zero. I also need a filter update routine, of course, and that computes the new output sample. So I get my input, pass through, and I compute my new output sample. And that's pretty much it. So let's go over to the C file and see how these functions are implemented. So the first order IRR init function just checks if the filter coefficients are bounded correctly, and then I store them in my struct. So I check if it's below zero, I set it to zero. If it's above one, I set it to one. Otherwise, I simply just store it. Then I reset my filter output, and that's about it. Now the interesting routine is this update routine. Let's see how to do that. Now if I pull up my slide to the left here, this is the difference equation or the IRR filter we'd like to implement. What it's telling us is that the new output, so let's write the output is one minus the filter coefficient, which is alpha, times our current input, which is in, which is part of the function. And I add to that alpha times the previous output, which is stored in our struct. So I just need to access that, and that's it. So you can see here, all I've done is transfer from our IRR difference equation into the code as very straightforward, very direct, and quite intuitive, actually. So the output is some constant times the current input, plus a constant times the previous output. And I store all of that in my new output sample, and then I return the filter output. Going into my main.c, I need to, of course, include my new header file and my new code. I am defining my IRR filter alpha, which I then just can just change and play around with, to about 0.5, so somewhere in the middle, just as a starting value. Then, of course, I need to define my struct, which I'll call filt. I need to initialize my low pass filter, so I need to pass it my alpha value, and that'll then set also the output to zero. And this board actually supports USB, so I'll actually be streaming my raw accelerometer data and my filtered accelerometer data via USB, and we can plot that and see how the filter is performing. So every time I get an interrupt for my data ready pin, this fires, and in my main loop, I check, and then I read the accelerations, and then I actually filter my accelerometer reading. For this example, I'm just going to filter one axis, the x axis. So I pass the struct by reference, then also this acceleration value, which is raw. Now, when it's ready to send the data via the virtual COM port via USB, I simply pass the raw accelerometer reading as well as the filtered output. So let's upload this code to the board and see what our filter actually does. All right, so I'm going to upload my code to the board by clicking this arrow over here. It compiles, it waits for the debugger connection, and then it uploads it. Now I'm using this tool called the Serial Oscilloscope, and if you Google that, it's actually quite a useful tool to plot things streamed via, for example, a virtual COM port. So I'll open that, choose my serial port, which is created by my STM32, and you can see I'm getting quite a lot of samples through here. I can click a telescope, and now if I move, and you see my red trace is my raw data from the accelerometer, and my green trace is the filter data. 
from our simple first order IRR filter, as you can see, all the high frequency noise is nicely attenuated, but my underlying trend is still there. And this is a really, really simple IRR filter, but this is perfectly fine for something such as sensor smoothing or signal smoothing. So this is really cool and a very simple implementation. So I hope you enjoyed this video. If you did, please give it a thumbs up, hit subscribe if you haven't already, and thank you so much. I'll see you in the next video.